Good morning. Please open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. As you know very well, we are currently studying Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians, and we are in the second half of that letter, where Paul is teaching us about how to live a holy life, how to live a life of sanctification. First, we are told who we are in Jesus Christ, and then we are instructed about how we ought to live in light of who we are in Jesus Christ. And as we introduced last week, we find that the very first issue that Paul raises in terms of living a holy life is that of sexual purity. Paul addresses sexual immorality immediately as he begins to turn his focus to the way in which we ought to live. And so last week, we dedicated a sermon to understanding what sexual immorality is and why it is such a prevalent and prominent uh, force in our lives and in our culture around us. We noted that God has given to mankind, to men and women, he has given to us a physical appetite for good things, and that sexuality is a good thing to be experienced and to be enjoyed in the context, exclusively in the context of marriage. And yet we, because of sin, corrupting our nature, we abuse the good things that God has given to us. We do not enjoy them within the boundaries that God has given to us, and so sexual immorality is all those things which violate the boundaries that God has given to us, and we'll we'll come back to that in the sermon itself. Now, what we're going to do in this sermon is to focus on Paul's instructions to, to abstain, to stay away from How can we fight against, how can we abstain from sexual immorality? That will be the focus of this sermon. But before we get into our outline, let us read the Word of God. Let us read our text of Scripture so that we can guide and ground our study of it. So please look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with me, verses 3 through 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, for our outline, it's going to be a pretty full outline. We're going to have seven main points, seven main points, trying to answer the question, how can we abstain from sexual immorality? And the first point will be, see it as God sees it. See it as God sees it. This means having a proper definition, not coming up with our own definition, which we discussed last week. We need to be sure that we see sexual immorality the way that God sees it so that our consciences are sensitive to what God tells us to be sensitive to. This is good and proper and right. This is wicked and evil and must be abstained from, must be rejected as sin. And what I want to to emphasize under this point, since we spent so much time last week talking about a proper definition, what I want to emphasize under this is that we should not allow the fact that there are different, that there are different, uh, let's let's say grades of sexual perversion. We should not allow the fact that some perversions are worse than others. We shouldn't allow that to cause us to become more comfortable, perhaps, with other forms. So, for example, we know that certain perversions are exceedingly vile. The scriptures in the Law of Moses and in the and the New Testament mention several sexual sins that are exceedingly vile and contrary to nature. We also know that acts of sexual violence are extremely and exceedingly wicked. The worst of the worst, let us say. 
And so we know that some immorality, some sexual immorality, also has more practical consequences than others. The effects of different kinds of sexual immorality are different. And so as we look at different degrees of sexual immorality, do not let that cause us to see lesser degrees as less heinous in God's eyes, or, less, or more respectable in some way, or more acceptable to us. So, for example, we know that really everywhere in our day and age, the sin of pornography is rampant. And we might think, well, there's only one person involved here, and there may or may not be actions taken on the part of that person. Let those who understand, understand. You might approach that issue and think, well, you know, it's not the same. It's, it's different. This is something else, right? But do we let the smaller fish out of the net because we're fishing for the big ones? Is our, do we have a leaky net? No. You see, we cannot abstain from sexual sin or fight against sexual immorality if we do not see it as God sees it. Properly defined, as we saw last week, the viewing of explicit material is sin because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ tells us that to look upon another with lust in the heart is to commit adultery in our heart. And so just the, just the desire of the heart as one beholds another is properly and truly sin. So there's no way to make it respectable. There's no way to make it acceptable. There's no way to make it in any way appropriate for one of God's creatures. Listen to what John Colcahoon said. I don't know how to pronounce that last name, so I'm just going to go with Colcahoon. He said this. <clears throat> he said, when God forbids us to commit adultery, he at the same time prohibits fornication, incest, and all impure imaginations, affections, and purposes. Where great sins are expressly forbidden, all the lesser sins of that sort are forbidden. And they are prohibited under the names of the grosser sins in order to render them more detestable and horrible in our view, and also to show us how abominable even the very least of them is in the sight of an infinitely holy and righteous God. Do not think that a small fire is safe because it's not a brush fire. They're both fires, and fires burn. And they're all bad, and they're all destructive, and they're all chaotic. And so we need to see sin as God sees it. If it is sin, it is unacceptable, even if there are greater degrees of it, even if there are things that are more vile and more perverse that does not change the fact that all sexual immorality is properly sin and must be rejected and hated by the child of God. The Pharisees lusted in their hearts, and they thought they were fine. They were comfortable with that because they were not taking action, because they were not doing anything to break the law of God outwardly. And Jesus confronts them in their sins, and he says, even to look upon another with lust in the heart is sin. So do not make their mistake. As you initiate your battle against sin, you need to know it properly, what it is, and you need to see it as God sees it. Let me just repeat the definition we gave last week for absolute clarity. Sexual immorality is the giving or receiving of of sexual pleasure in any way outside of marriage. Sexual immorality is the giving or receiving of sexual pleasure in any way outside of marriage. With that clear, it becomes clear or clearer for us to know what it is that we are abstaining from. We are abstaining from the giving or receiving of sexual pleasure in any way outside of marriage even unto the viewing of another with lust. If we become okay with something through a leaky definition, the scriptures confront us and say this, Can a man hold fire to his bosom and not be burnt? Can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be burned? Can we keep a small fire without it light igniting a greater fire? We cannot. And so step one of abstaining from sexual immorality is seeing sin as God sees it, or to put it another way, having a proper definition of sexual immorality. Number two, because we have to move quickly to get through everything. Number two, be smarter than your body. Be smarter than your body. Remember two things here. Number one is that sexuality is partly 
a matter of physical appetite. It's partly a body issue. Or not even issue in a negative sense, just it's partly a body thing. Sexuality is partly due, is in part a bodily thing. That's not very eloquent, but you understand. The second thing we need to remember is that Paul specifically tells us that abstaining from sexual immorality is a matter of controlling our own bodies. Controlling our own bodies. How do I control my own body? One way is being smarter than your body. Now, what do I mean by this? God has made us, as we said last week, so that our bodies naturally desire physical intimacy. That is a natural thing, and it is not wrong to have those desires because God has created us in that way. But if one is not married, then there, there are no outlets. There are no safe zones. There is no pure sexuality for that person. Everything is off the table. And if you are married, only that which involves your spouse is available to you. So there are, there are limitations, which means there will be times which is all the time for a single person, and there will be times for a married person where intimacy is not available at that time. It is, it is off the table. So what do you do when temptations, when your body has these desires for something that is not available to you because you're single or because you're married and circumstances have prevented it? Well, you need to be smarter than your body at that point. If you abstain from the sin in that moment, remember this, you'll be just fine. Now, why do I say that? Because your bodies will tell you otherwise. When you don't eat and you don't drink, what happens? Your body starts saying, you're dying, you're dying, you're dying. Eat, drink, eat, drink, you're dying. Well, so also, when we have physical desires for physical intimacy, your body will say, you're dying, you're dying, you're dying. You need to be smarter than your body and realize this is not food and drink. This is a pleasure that the Lord has given to us. This is not survival. And if you can't live without that pleasure, no, but I must have it, then you are living in discontentment. So resist bodily urges, realizing however much my body screams at me, if there's no pure option available to me, I'm going to be smarter than my body, I'll live. <laughs> I'll be just fine. It's difficult not to scratch an itch, but you can do it. Why? Because your hands don't scratch itches themselves, do they? The only way that you're, you scratch that itch is if you put your hand to scratch the itch. And you can keep your hand here and your hand here. So also let the reader understand it is up to us to control our bodies. And we cannot say, well, I, I have this strong feeling or anything like that. To ex we can't use that to excuse anything. We have to be smarter than our bodies and resist. Your body will not act on its own. You are the agent here. You are the one who performs physical actions with your body, and so it's up to you to have self-control over your body to not do certain things with it. So, Pastor, what you're saying is when sexual temptation comes to the body, you just don't do it? Yes, actually, that's true, because it's just like scratching the itch. How do I not scratch this itch? You don't touch it. You just don't do it. Yes, but I want you to give me some system. Okay, tie my hand behind my back. <laughs> okay, if you want to, you can do that, but that's not real self-control, is it? We'll continue to talk about that in the next point. So be smarter than your body. It will scream at you, and you need to be smarter. This is not a bodily appetite that, upon which survival rests. Thirdly, and we'll spend most of our time here, number three, discipline your mind. Discipline your mind. Sexual desires, of course, are not just a physical matter. They're also a mental matter, something in the mind, in the emotional and mental life of the human being. We may deny the body's appetites, but we must learn to deny sins in the mind as well. Paul calls this the passion of lust. A passion is something that comes upon you. There are bodily passions, I become hungry. There are mental passions, I, be, I become tempted by a desire, I become tempted by the idea of a thing. And so when the passion of lust comes upon the mind, how can we discipline the mind in order to abstain 
from sexual immorality. And now, now we will descend to four subpoints. Four subpoints. Training our minds. Number one, pray. We just read in Ephesians chapter 6 that after we put on the whole armor of God, what do we combine with it? Prayer and supplication and persevering in prayer, Paul says. Remember what we have studied in our sermons on sanctification and our sermon last week on sexual purity. One of the things that we saw is that God has promised us in his covenant with us to change our hearts, to give us his spirit, and to cause us to walk in his ways. God has promised these things to his children. Therefore, why would we ever go into battle without appealing to the God of the universe to help us in this fight against sin when he has promised to do so? And is that not what we are always to pray for? What are we to pray for? For that which God has promised in his word. Remember David going up against Goliath. He says, Give me, he, he prays to God for help and he tells Goliath, you're going to see. It's not by the strength of my arm, he says, but it's the, the Lord God, the God of the Lord of hosts who will fight for us this day, and you will see his victory. And so also, we need to pray to God to help us to overcome both in body and in mind these temptations. And God has promised us the help of his Holy Spirit to enable us to resist temptation and to overcome it. Pray for the Spirit's help. Pray to sin, to see sin as God sees it. Pray to be humble. Pray to be vigilant. But what do we always need to couple with prayer? What always goes together with it? Effort and action. So secondly, the second sub-point, number two, understanding that temptations come to the mind and we must discipline it, understanding that we must initiate our battle with prayer. Number two, exchange vices for virtues. Exchange vices for for virtues. And the, the next subpoints will continue to develop this. I want to, I want to push your thinking in a certain direction here. When temptation arises in the mind, if you concentrate very hard on not thinking about a particular temptation, what will you do? You're just going to be thinking about it. Don't think about donuts and coffee. Stop thinking about donuts and coffee. It doesn't work. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to remove a temptation from the mind when it is precisely that which you have in mind. So what do you do? You replace it with something else. You replace a vice with a virtue, with its opposite virtue. This is a particular sin, temptation, vice. What is the opposite virtue? What is the opposite holiness? What is the opposite good thing? And you begin to cultivate that thing and pursue that thing. So you move the mind away, not just thinking negatively, how do I stop thinking about this thing? That won't work. Yes, we reject it and say no to it in our minds, but you have to then exchange that vice for a virtue. What is the opposite virtue of sexual immorality? Well, it's purity. But I want you to realize that purity, that can be expressed in two ways. These are not subpoints because we're going to get, go through them in other subpoints. The, the opposite vice, excuse me, the opposite virtue of the vice of sexual immorality is purity, which is expressed, number one, in abstinence from sexual immorality. It is pure, not to sin, of course. But purity is also expressed in marital intimacy. Keep that in mind as we move forward. If I am to exchange a vice for a virtue, or a virtue for a vice, what is available to me in the case of sexual immorality? Abstinence from sexual immorality, not doing the sin, and marital intimacy. Which brings us to the third sub-point here as we discipline our minds. Thinking in a different way. Number three. Take steps toward marriage. Take steps toward marriage. Imagine that the Lord our God made us as human beings with a natural 
appetite and desire to fly. He created us to look at the skies, and we, we long to fly. And let us suppose that the Lord our God said, gave us this desire to fly, but said, but only pilots may fly. Only pilots may fly. You all have a desire to fly. You must become a pilot in order to fly. Well, how disastrous would it be if everybody took to the skies without the proper training of a pilot? You would die in many different ways. <laughs> you would die as you tried to fly without the, the training of a pilot. It would be chaos and death. But you have a natural desire to fly, so what do you do? Well, if you have a desire to fly, but you're not yet a pilot, you would take steps towards becoming a pilot. And when you have a, a, a strong urge to take to the skies, but you're not a pilot yet, what should you do? Read the pilot's training manual. Take steps towards becoming a pilot. So also, I want to, us to discipline our minds to realize that for those who are unmarried, the Lord has made us in a certain way to desire certain things. The arena within which, the context within which that thing is to be enjoyed is marriage. And so if you are presented with the sin of sexual immorality, the opposite virtue, you can move towards it, not only through abstinence, but through taking steps towards where it can be enjoyed in purity. Taking steps towards marriage. This is not the normal way that people think. People normally think, tell me how to fight sexual sin means tell me how to not do the bad thing. And I want us to couple with that doing the good thing, which is not just a nun's life, but rather it is taking steps towards where God has given us the proper context for such things to be enjoyed. So consider the fact that we should not delay marriage unnecessarily. We should not delay marriage unnecessarily, nor should we allow the wedding and all of its little details be the master controller of everything. Because a wedding is a luxury, not a necessity. Why do I say that? To get married, you just need two people who consent and have a marriage license. You know, you can get married any day that the county clerk's office is open. <laughs> Once you complete a marriage license application with the state of California, you can get married immediately. Now, you may come up with a million and one reasons why you shouldn't get married tomorrow, and they're probably very good reasons. But I want to push your thinking. Am I living a life that is constantly tempted and taking no steps towards the place in w w that God has given to us? And remember some perspective here. We're focusing and focusing and focusing on, on marital intimacy because that's what Paul has brought up. But there's so much more to, to marriage and married life that God has also called us to, to be fruitful and to multiply and to love one another. And so preparing oneself for marriage is obviously not just preparing oneself to delight in this particular thing, but we're focusing on it because that is what Paul is focusing on in this text. So however strange it may sound, when, sex, when sexual temptation arises for the single person, pursuing the opposite virtue of that vice, one of the ways in which you can do that is taking steps toward getting married. Making yourself a more fit candidate as a husband or a wife, a future husband or a future wife. God made us to be one flesh as man and woman. So don't let culture and condition and comfort keep you where you are. Am I urging all singles to run to the altar tomorrow? No. But I am telling you that marriage is good and it is pure and God has given it to us and God has called it to us and the marriage bed is undefiled and it is the opposite virtue of the vice of sexual immorality for singles. For some, it may be too late. For some, marriage may not be a realistic option for them in their lives. And in such case, the only opposite virtue of the vice of sexual immorality is complete and absolute abstinence. There is no arena for that person to express and enjoy sexual desires at all. When we start to say that, sometimes we realize our culture is so messed up. Our culture is so messed up because it 
It sends everyone into the skies without pilot's licenses. And what do we find in our culture? Everyone crashes and burns. Fourth sub-point. Disciplining my mind. is a matter of recognizing that temptation comes upon us as well as coming from us. We should pray to God for his help. We should exchange vices for virtues, which for the single person means abstinence, yes, but also taking steps towards marriage. Fourth, now looking more towards spouses, number four, flirt with your spouse. What? I'm dead serious. I have bad news for you. Marriage is not a magic solution for sexual immorality or immoral desires. Every married person knows this. Marriage is not a magic solution for sexual immorality or immoral desires. Spouses must keep their minds and bodies pure. So if you are a spouse and you are tempted in your mind and body unto sexual immorality, how do you discipline your mind? You pursue the opposite virtue of that vice. You go find your spouse, and you flirt with them. How do I do that, Pastor? I will not answer that question. (laughs) If you have desires, natural human desires for intimacy, and and that desire comes upon you, don't go to the digital world. Don't go to another person. Go to your spouse your beloved, your companion, your flesh. You don't have to feel bad about this desire. You just have to enjoy it where it's supposed to be enjoyed. Christians can be perceived as prudish or as a legalistic group of people who don't want anyone to be happy. And that's in part because we strive for ourselves and for our children to dress and to act and speak in pure ways. And so we should give off a perception of Purity. Correct. But the fact that we guard our, ourselves in our interactions with others and the world around us in no way means that a Christian husband or wife should refrain from that which is flirtatious and romantic with one another. Just because we won't flirt with the world like the world flirts with the world, that means nothing in the context of a marriage relationship where all of that is to be enjoyed and to be cultivated and to be practiced. Quite to the contrary, let us be quite clear. Once you're married, you are free to be intentionally erotic with your spouse. Pastor, I'm dead serious. If we ever doubt the goodness and purity of spouses enjoying one another, remember Song of Solomon. God has given us in his word erotic poetry. In his word. And not only has God given us erotic poetry in his word, it is so pure and good, so clean, that it is an image and a picture of Jesus Christ and the church. So if you ever doubt its goodness and its purity, look right there. If there was anything wicked, if there was anything impure, if there was anything wrong about marital intimacy and the delighting of a husband and a wife in one another, it would never become an image for Jesus Christ and the church, and it would have no place in the word of God. But it is the opposite. Very much the opposite, where we see the spouses delighting in one another and speaking to one another and inviting one another. You see, what I'm trying to do is to help you fight sin, not just by pointing to its badness and its definition, which is so important, but also balancing that with a pursuit and a cultivation of the good things which God has given to us, the opposite virtues of that particular vice. And is not sanctification putting to death of sin and cultivation of obedience to God's commands? It is. And so I'm simply calling you to sanctification. We have defined sin so that we see it as God sees it. All of that's off the table. But God has given to us something beautiful to enjoy in the context of marriage, so I'm calling you to enjoy it. But what often happens at this point What often happens is that I can say these things all day long. I can tell you to romance each other and all this kind of thing, to enjoy what only spouses can enjoy. But perhaps your marriage relationship is hardly in a place where romance is going to blossom. Perhaps you're far from one another in heart, 
and so therefore you are far from one another in body. Well, that means that you have serious weeding to do in the garden of your marriage. You need to clear the stones, clear the weeds, plant and water new flowers so that they can grow and blossom. And in such cases, we need to realize that the opposite virtue of lust is not just the act of marital intimacy, but it is also everything else that promotes love and happiness and heart intimacy between spouses. And so when we are tempted to sexual immorality, I'm not saying that the one and only thing that we run to in the opposite direction is the actual act of of physical intimacy, but all those things which produce heart intimacy and body intimacy between spouses. And so think about this. For the single person, if they are busy making themselves a better future husband or a better future wife, they won't be busy in sexual immorality. And if a husband or a wife is busy in promoting heart and body intimacy with their spouse, what are they not doing? They're not committing sexual immorality. And that's how I want us to discipline our minds, to realize God has given us good things richly to enjoy, and it is the fullness of the marriage relationship. Because God gave us marriage so that we could make each other happy. Husbands are to make their wife happy. Wives are to make their husband happy. And if you're busy being kind and caring to your spouse, if you're busy building up their happiness, guess what you're defeating? You're defeating lust. Again, when people think of sexual immorality, they think of some system that will trap it and destroy it. They want some system that will make it stop. And we've we've seen from the word of God and from experience and reason That's not going to happen because it comes from our natures, and God's given us a desire for something good. And so rather than trying to trap it and contain it with some kind of uh, program or system that will prevent us from sin, however useful some of those tools may be, we must always couple with such things a promotion and a cultivation of the virtues that God has given to us, which are seen most clearly and expressed most fully in the marriage relationship. So love your spouse in a variety of ways, one of which is physical intimacy. Fourthly, back to our main outline. Fourth point. We need to see sin as God sees it. We need to be smarter than our bodies. We need to discipline our minds. Number four, bring sin to light. Bring sin to light. Please listen very carefully. Repentance is is good. Repentance is good. Let us be honest. We are very often more worried about the shame of repentance than about the shame of sin. In other words, we sin freely and we repent hesitantly. And now I want you to realize how insane that is. Because the truth is that sin is bad and shameful, and repentance is good and is the means through which we remove shame from our lives. Yes, there is a shamefulness in repentance because it brings our sin to light, but repentance is how that sin is brought to light, and then it is put away. The shame is removed and taken off. Do not fear repentance. Fear sin. Sin is a merciless master. It promises pleasure and delivers pain. Sin is an enslaver, promising freedom and delivering imprisonment. Repentance, on the other hand, is a path to true health and freedom and the happiness of a clear conscience and refreshed communion with God. Brothers and sisters, do not be ashamed to repent. Be ashamed to sin. And when you have sinned, undo and remove its shame through repentance. But this will humble me, but this will humiliate me, but this will bring shame. You've already done that yourself by sinning. Repentance will not bring that upon you. You've already brought it upon yourself. Repentance will remove the shame from you. Repentance does not create shame. Sin creates shame. Repentance takes it away. Remember the man in the Corinthian church 
who was intimate with his stepmother. And Paul says, put that one away from you because he was unrepentant. But we find in in 2 Corinthians that by then that man has repented. And Paul says, welcome that one and restore, renew your love to him. When the church is busy renewing its love to one who has repented, the shame is taken away through that, but only because of repentance. And so we ought to repent to our spouses. We ought to repent to those against whom we have sinned, recognizing, yes, it will bring shame to light, but we've already, it's just bringing to light what was already there, and repentance is the way of removing it. Fifthly, because we need to accelerate a little bit. Fifthly, how do we abstain from sexual immorality? Well, we just said we repent of it. Fifthly, prepare your children. Prepare your children. They will face this temptation, as we all do. We must equip them with the proper knowledge. At the right age, at the right time, they need to know what sexual immorality is so that they know what it is they need to abstain from. But they also need to know the positive side, the goodness of sexuality that God has given to us. And so they need to see outwardly, they need to see a healthy example of loving mutual affection from dad to mom set before them so that they know that a husband and wife love one another affectionately and they are told that there is another level of physical affection that is enjoyed between spouses and is good and holy and pure so that they know what is the bad thing and what is the good thing and where and when will I be allowed to enjoy that. If those things are clear for them, then the temptations that come their way will still be strong, will still be difficult. They must still fight them, but at least they have the tools of knowledge that they need to know what is wrong, what is right, and how to pursue or or oppose the vice and the virtue. We need to prepare our children. And one of the ways we do this is not just instructing them about these things, but also raising sons to be husbands and raising daughters to be wives. Because again, the context within which sexual purity is practiced is marriage. And so we don't just set them up to fight the sin, we set them up to launch them into marriage, to launch them into a a heart and body relationship between husband and wife. And this is another massive systemic failing in our culture. I must get my child to have the ideal college education and career path, and I must launch them on that. That is so much more a priority, even for Christians, than I must prepare my son to be a good husband. I must prepare my daughter to be a good wife. And we need to repent if we have imbalanced those things. Are those things entirely opposed to each other? No, not at all but they need to be balanced and prioritized correctly. We have a responsibility as parents to set our children up to become husbands and wives. And if we disable them from that by not preparing them to be husbands and wives, then we almost set them up to live a life of singleness, tempted with sexual immorality, where marriage is just something that will hopefully show up in the future. We must prepare them to teach boys to provide and to lead and to love and to teach girls to know how to support and submit and love. These are the responsibilities of husbands and wives. But if we don't train our our boys to lead and to love and we don't train our our daughters to submit and to love, so many problems follow from these things. And sexual immorality is one piece of that equation. Number six, Six, number six is a question. What is the cost of sexual immorality? What is the cost of sexual immorality? Number one, two things. Number one, we rob our brother. We rob our brother. Paul says this. 
He says that sexual immorality, immorality defrauds and robs and deceives another person. When he uses the word brother, adelphos, it means man or woman. It means someone, it's our neighbor. Another human being just like us, another person created in God's image. He says that when we commit sexual immorality, we rob that person. And we need to see it that way. It's easy to indulge in sexual sin when it's viewed as two people sharing pleasure. It's difficult, or at least more difficult, to indulge in sexual sin when it's viewed as one person robbing another or two people agreeing to rob one another. In our text, Paul says, let no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. To transgress is to go where you're not supposed to go. No trespassing, transgress. And to wrong means to give someone the bad end of a deal, basically. In other words, to defraud or to steal. Paul reminds us that I need to look at the person next to me in such a way that their innocence and their purity is important to me. And rather than taking it away from them, I want to protect their innocence and I want to protect their purity. I will not transgress on their innocence. I will not walk on it, nor will I take it away from them. Rather, I will protect it and respect it. Abstaining from sexual immorality, therefore, is not just a matter of controlling myself, though it absolutely is. It's also a matter of loving my neighbor. It's a matter of saying, what is the cost? If, if I indulge in sexual immorality with this person, what is it going to cost? I'm going to have to rob them of their innocence and their purity. When you put it in those terms, it becomes much more difficult to, in, to indulge oneself in the passion of of lust. Do you like being robbed? Do you like it when people take things that belong to you? Do you like paying property taxes? No. Do you like being robbed? You don't like being robbed. No one does. We need to view sexual immorality in those terms. Transgressing and wronging. Not just, Paul's not just saying doing something wrong to them. He's saying taking advantage of them. It's a bad exchange. He says you're giving them sin and, and guilt and you're taking their innocence and their purity, even if it's mutual. We need to understand the cost, and that helps us to abstain. If I'm busy protecting your innocence and protecting your purity, I will not be transgressing and wronging you. It's very clear. The second thing that is a cost of sexual immorality, number two, we disregard the holy avenging God. We disregard the holy, avenging God. Keeping the law is a matter of loving our neighbor, certainly, but what, it is, what is it above all to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength? And Paul reminds us here that sexual immorality is not just sin against our neighbor. It's not just sin against our brother. It's not just robbing them. It is also disregarding the holy, avenging God of the universe. Look at all of his reasons in our text. He says, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, God has given innocence and purity to that person. You have robbed it. God is an avenger. God is specifically the avenger of the innocent. And he goes on and says, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. You're going to disregard that? Therefore, Paul says, whoever disregards this, the call to purity and holiness... Disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Paul makes it very clear. This is not, this is not an area for being lax. This is not something where you, where you say, well, you know, when I get around to it. This is not an area where you say, well, you know, I'm, str I'm struggling. I'm fighting. Yeah, I really struggle with this. Paul says... There's no negotiation, there's no peace, there's no treaty, there's no space, no freedom, no legitimacy given whatsoever to sexual immorality in our lives. God has given us his Holy Spirit. He has called us to holiness and impurity, and he is the avenger of the innocent. And the scriptures tell us that his wrath will be poured out on the sexually 
immoral. And so I ask you to consider this question. Are, in the context of what is the cost of sexual immorality, I ask you this question, are moments of imperfect stolen pleasure worth an eternity of judgment? Are moments of imperfect stolen pleasure worth an eternity of judgment? Are temporary indulgences of bodily passions worth everlasting torment? Paul says in Colossians 3, 5 to 6, Put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Just as he told the Thessalonians, God is an avenger in all these things. If the wrath of God come, is coming for these things, if God is an avenger in these things, who can take them lightly? Consider yourself, as Paul says, solemnly warned. Seventhly and lastly, where is lasting joy and true pleasure? Where is lasting joy and true pleasure? In two places. Number one, in Christ. In Christ. Brothers and sisters, when we are honest about these things, if you have a big swimming pool filled with mud, thick, nasty mud, which is sexual immorality, we've, we in our culture have dived into it, and we've opened our mouths, and we've taken a huge drink of it. We've drowned in it. But in Christ, we have a cleansed conscience. Christ takes us out of that, and he cleanses us, and he forgives us, and he is a perfect spouse to us. We can find lasting joy and true pleasure in a clear conscience before God because by faith we come to Jesus Christ and embrace him and his righteousness and his obedience, and we are forgiven. Our sins are forgiven, and in that way we have lasting joy, and in that way we have true pleasure because we will be with Jesus Christ for eternity, and we will be like him, and we will be perfected in him. And so we need to see Jesus Christ and God's glory shining in his face as our lasting joy and true pleasure. And the cleansed conscience that he promises us, we need to see that as a joy and a treasure for us, which he gives freely to all who come to him, for all who come to him and, and bow before him and trust in him and believe in him, he will cleanse you and forgive you of your sins. And the second way in which we find lasting joy and true pleasure is in serving Christ. In serving Christ. And here we see even more, just adding upon adding, the mercy and the goodness of our God. Why? Because when God has called us to light and to holiness... Has he therefore denied to us his children and his creatures? Has he denied to us the pleasures of the body? Not at all. Not at all. He has given us all things richly to enjoy. We eat the good foods of the earth. We drink the good drinks of the earth. And the Lord our God has given us marriage in which physical intimacy is 100% undefiled and to be enjoyed. And so the Christian can delight in physical intimacy with a clear conscience in the marriage relationship, all the while serving Jesus Christ. And so we come to him and are forgiven our sins. And in the context of marriage, we delight in all those things that God has given to us. And, and what can we say but that God has so blessed us? He has so blessed us. And if we are failing to enjoy such blessings, it's not because God has failed to give it to us. It's because we have failed to cultivate such things in our lives. And in our, what I mean is in our marriages. Oh, brothers and sisters, let us rejoice that we have been given Christ. And we have been given a holy life to live in Christ. 
which involves the delightful things of the earth that do please our bodies and please our minds, and we can enjoy them to the glory of God with a clear conscience. What a wonderful and kind Savior we have who has given to us such wonderful and beautiful things. And let that beauty and goodness be such a motivation to us to walk in that light and not stray from that path into the darkness and wickedness of sin. We need to see sin as God sees it, but see holiness as God sees it and delight in it. Oh, brothers and sisters, let us be careful and let us be busy in cultivating a love for God and a love for our neighbor and especially a love for our spouses in these things. To God be the glory. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we on earth are so concerned with the pleasures of this life, which you have given to us to enjoy. But we ask that you would forgive us for abusing those things, for misusing them, for taking, the, for taking them when they do not belong to us, for taking them when we ought not to. We pray that you would please work in us by your Holy Spirit to continue to change us and conform us more and more to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, to conform us more and more to your will. Please help us to see sin as you see it, to hate it as you hate it, to reject it as you have called us to reject it. And help us also to pursue and to cultivate and to promote all that which is in compliance with your holiness, your goodness, your law, your will. Please help us to be faithful parents that prepare and raise the next generation to act with knowledge, to inform their consciences of what is right and what is wrong, and to help them and enable them to begin a married life. Oh Lord, we pray that we as spouses would be faithful in heart and conduct, that we would not only reject sin, but that we would cultivate a heart intimacy and a body intimacy with our spouse. Oh Lord, help us to do this with wisdom and patience. Help us to do this to your glory and in all purity. And we pray that you would please, once again, forgive us our many sins. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.